The Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station has also waged war against diseases that threaten people. The 2010 BP oil spill raised concerns that Gulf seafood might be unsafe to eat. To this point, it's remained safe from contamination, as proven by monitoring from organizations like the LSU Ag Center. But there have always been naturally occurring bacteria, internal invaders, that threaten seafood safety. Well, our lab does seafood safety for uh, the seafood industry. There's really nobody in the state that does uh, what they need to make sure the quality of their seafood is good for the consumer. Vibrio vulnificus is one of the main concerns in the Gulf uh, of Mexico. Uh, it causes a lot of outbreaks in the summer months. It's a pathogen that is mainly um, a problem in the elderly, people that have their immune system uh, defective or compromised in some way, and it can kill them. People like raw oysters. They love raw oysters. And the only way to control Vibrios in oysters is by heat treating process. Uh, well, then it doesn't taste the same. So I work with them related to that, trying to find natural ways to control Vibrios so that people can still have their raw oysters. The LSU Ag Center Lab invented a powerful weapon in the fight against Vibrio vulnificus and other harmful bacteria. It's an antibody-based dipstick that seafood companies can use to detect dangerous microorganisms in less than five minutes. I do a lot of applied research, and, and that's what's so exciting about it, because you're doing something important and you're helping people and uh, the economy. Dr. Jack Lasso and his chronic disease prevention lab discovered oysters contain an unexpected pearl of great value a tool for combating breast cancer. By filtering phytoplankton, oysters accumulate a lot of bioactive uh, material. And then one of them is what they call ceramide, which is a bioactive lipids. We were able to isolate bioactive uh, ceramide and then uh, tested it on breast cancer cells uh, and then found that cancer cells could not grow. Lasso has also worked to transform waste from plants and animals into healing remedies. The seafood industry discards millions of pounds of fish and alligator carcasses every year. I saw the waste of the seafood processing industry. When I came back, I said, what can we do with it? That's where I developed the idea of getting collagen out of fish skin. Collagen as a protein maintained the structure of the skin. Lasso's lab has extracted collagen from fish and alligators. These collagen extracts can be used for healing burned or damaged skin, for implants, and for other biomedical uses. I think we can help millions of people around the world with what we're doing. Medicinal plants researcher Zijian Liu traveled to a remote region of China in search of the sweet leaf tea plant. For hundreds of years, it's been grown only there as a traditional remedy for sickness. Liu brought samples back to discover whether science would validate this folk medicine. We are the first one in the world that discovered sweet leaf tea can be used for the prevention of uh, obesity and uh, prevention of cancer recurrence. Obesity and cancer tend to operate similarly in the way they spread through the body. Angiogenesis is a process where cells, like cancer cells, send out blood vessels to feed the growth and spread of new cells. So the sweet leaf tea was capable of stopping the formation of angiogenesis, or new blood vessel formation. Later on, we brought Ian MD Anderson to test for its cancer preventive uh, property. For the sweet leaf tea, we have a convincing case uh, that it can be a chemo preventative agent, natural agent, for managing cancer from recurrence. The LSU Ag Center and MD Anderson now hold joint patents on that extract and others as well. 
Liu's biotechnology lab has more recently developed an innovative process for making previously indissoluble pharmaceuticals dissolvable in water using safe natural compounds. It's a novel process that can unlock greater success for existing medicines while eliminating side effects and increasing shelf life. Sure enough, this technology has been unique and my lab is the only one in the world who is doing this type of research. Robert Godke was responsible for cloning the world's first transgenic goats. These animals produced the human protein AT3 in their milk. And then the milk was collected and the human protein taken out. It's now used during heart and cardiovascular surgery to decrease clotting. I had no idea, and I don't think many of us who worked in business ever dreamed that this potential would be there. Plowing the land to eliminate weeds can cause erosion and runoff problems. Researchers at the Northeast Station and Macon Ridge Station pioneered an approach called conservation tillage. Instead of plowing every acre, farmers use herbicides to kill winter weeds before planting their crops. That technique, conservation tillage, is practiced all over the United States now, and it has done wonders for improving water quality in the streams of this state and, and the entire nation. And that is certainly one of the revolutionary developments in the history of, of, of weed control, was the ability to produce crops successfully, economically, effectively, with a minimum use of tillage. Destructive forces of weather regularly storm the beaches and marshland of Louisiana. Researcher Carrie Knott, America's only coastal plants breeder, has been working to refortify coast and marsh against these attacks by sea. Coastal grasses are very important, especially in Louisiana, because of the rate of coastal erosion. So hurricanes, uh, tropical storms, storm surge, um, all threaten to erode the, the land away. And those plants are vital to reduce coastal erosion. Until you can put plants on those rebuilt marshlands, you can't really stabilize them against future storms. That's where the Ag Center research comes in. And what I'm doing is evaluating different lines of sea oats, smooth core grass, California bullwhip, and seeing which ones survive the best and actually accumulate most of the sediments and soils. The traditional approach is to plant vegetatively pots or sprigs by hand. We're developing, in addition, technologies that could be used for aerial seeding of these improved varieties. That way we can establish vegetation faster, cheaper, and on much greater acreages than we ever have before. So it's very satisfying to go out at these beaches and see how much sand my, my plant varieties have accumulated. It's very satisfying to go out on these marshes, uh, in the saline marshes, and see that my plants are not only surviving, but they're already building back uh, land. Our highly mobile society places a huge demand on energy resources. Researchers at the LSU Ag Center have taken waste products from unique crops to make new, cutting-edge biofuels that can benefit the nation. Nationally, corn-based ethanol has been perceived by some to escalate food costs. Here in Louisiana, we don't plan to enter that debate because our biofuels industry will be based on two crops. One is bagasse, which is a waste product from sugarcane. It's something that's produced in excess. We don't have a market for it. We can capture value from that waste product. We've actually been able to show that we can effectively produce ethanol from the gas. The research that we're doing is getting us very close to being cost competitive with petroleum. We also know that we can produce electricity very cost effectively with using the gas. Another important Louisiana biofuel crop is sweet sorghum. It's grown on poorer quality soils, so it doesn't put food crops out of production. The USDA has already singled out the LSU Ag Center to tap into these new energy sources. One of our major focuses now in the research that we're doing is how do we make a Louisiana factory a biorefinery? 
We know how to make sugar, but now we want to, you know, take that same factory that operates for only about 90 days a year and actually operate it for 365 days. 90 days for making sugar, the other days for making, you know, ethanol, butanol, are just electricity. Our cropping systems existing in Louisiana already have the waste products in place to build a biofuel industry. Insect pests have always been a threat to crops and homes, and they always will be. Wave after wave, reinforcements keep coming. But research minds continue to invent ways of repelling them. Well, the Formosan subterranean termite, it's an invasive species, and it costs the state of Louisiana about $500 million in a year alone. When the Formosan subterranean termite got here, it caused devastating damage in part because it builds such huge populations, millions in a population. And this is an example of the type of damage they do to a two by four, where they basically shred it. People around the world know about the French Quarter, know of the history of the French Quarter, and literally it was being eaten up by Formosan termites. So the federal government funded a treatment program for the quarter called Operation Full Stop. The LSU Ag Center worked closely with the USDA in the modern-day Battle of New Orleans. So Operation Full Stop started with initiative to come in with the newest technologies, treat as many of the buildings as possible, locate the termites where they are, and target the termites with targeted treatments, and reduce their populations. We use DNA profiles of termite colonies to identify colonies by their barcodes. You actually can imagine it like playing Sherlock Holmes and CSI <laughs> because you have to decipher all those barcodes and make sense out of the codes so that you can figure out who done it, who ate my house. It's gone down. There's a clear indication through the years that that area-wide treatment that was initiated using all those measures uh, works. We were very excited to see barcode profiles of termite colonies disappearing, showing treatment success. We were happy to see genetic bottlenecks showing population crashes. It's a battle, it's a never-ending battle, because for most and termites will always be here. They'll never be eradicated, but now we know that we can control them. Another success of the program has been spin-off technologies. The LSU Ag Center has patented a commercial pop-up monitor, which makes it easier for homeowners and pest companies to locate termites. The Ag Center also has a patent on a new environmentally safe method of killing termites called the Trojan horse. The termite eats a toxic yeast formula that destroys wood digesting organisms called protozoa living in the gut of the termite. It's a hidden attack from within. We have tried it out in the lab, the termites love to eat it, and the termite laboratory colony dies within three weeks from starvation. So, mission accomplished. Some koi pond enthusiasts had added the giant salvinia plant from South America to their aquatic gardens. When they threw the plant into Louisiana streams and ditches, they had no idea they were releasing an invasive monster. It increases its coverage of a water body. Uh, it doubles every day and a half. So the growth rate here compared to other plants in general is just off the scale. Individuals who have wanted to live on a lake all their lives, they buy a very expensive piece of property and build a nice house, and all of a sudden their lake view looks like a pasture. A thick vegetative mat sucks up oxygen and blocks out light, killing plants below, forcing fish to leave, and clogging boat motors. Herbicides tested by the Ag Center were effective, but too costly. So researchers recruited a tiny weapon from South America, the Salvinia weevil. Its favorite feast is giant Salvinia. The Goliath plant had now met its match. Weevils are, are fairly common. There are a lot of them in the state. The boll weevil the attacks cotton. The sweet potato weevil attacks sweet potatoes. What separates this weevil out from the others, they don't fly, which means we have to physically move them 
from one spot to another. I've become a bug chauffeur for about the last 10 years, so. Armies of these tiny weevils, which pose no threat to crops or the ecosystem, have been successful in controlling giant salvinia, particularly in southern Louisiana. But researchers are searching the globe for a weevil that can survive better in chillier climates while continuing to slay the giants. LSU Ag Center research discoveries have also helped sprout important new industries for the state. Jim Avalt was a visionary aquaculture scientist. He helped lay the foundation for one business that would become integral to the state's economy and inseparable from its culture. He literally developed the aquaculture research program at Ben-Hur. He is the grandfather of the dean of aquaculture in Louisiana as far as I'm concerned. At the time, there was no crawfish farming per se. I felt that if we could produce a predictable crop of crawfish year after year, we could actually develop a crawfish farming industry. And over the years, we conducted research with that in mind. Rice farmers in the 80s were struggling, so they decided to try Avalt's idea, rotating crawfish into their fields. It worked. So now, We've got two crops instead of one on the same piece of land. Avalt's team had not only helped create the crawfish craze, they made it profitable too, by helping develop a standard trap and baits. Really a lot of what we know now is, is all comes from LSU. They gave us data on trap spacing and population dynamics that, that just made us all a lot better. The economic impact to the state of Louisiana on just crawfish farming is more than $350 million a year. I think that pretty well states that we spawned an entire new industry. It's a part of life in South Louisiana. Uh, we'd be hard pressed to do without crawfish right now. I think we'd have a revolt. The fruit and truck experiment station in Hammond was created to help local vegetable and strawberry farmers. By the 60s, Louisiana led the nation in strawberry production, sending its fruits all over the country. The station was also America's leading strawberry research center. But the local produce market declined, and the fruit and truck experiment station, now called the Hammond Research Station, adapted its focus. And we looked around and saw that the green industry in Louisiana was growing rapidly. And a large core of it was situated in this area. Annually, millions of dollars have grown from trees and flowers. Landscape horticulture is a big business in Louisiana. The Hammond Research Station is dedicated to the uh, nursery and sod industry. And that's sort of unique because many states have many, many uh, research stations, but none that are dedicated directly to the nursery industry. We evaluate plants, we evaluate fertilizer, so we can tell them what works, so they don't have to guess about that. The Hammond Station has been conducting some of the largest plant evaluations in the state and in the South. And since the development of this program and, and this station, it has been a tremendous boon to the nursery industry because of the research that they're doing here. When you plant a plant in your yard, a research station has evaluated that plant to see if it does well there. The mulch you put down, the fertilizer you put down, the herbicide you put down has all been evaluated at a research station. So everything you do in your backyard, somebody in research has had a hand in it. There's a lot of adaptability of our research scientists to be able to move from, from what they do normally to see prospects and possibilities beyond the work that they're, they're initially starting. Ching Lin Wu is a wood scientist. Some of his research involved using waste wood and discarded water bottles and oil cans to create sturdy wood panel composites. Tom and Joanne Parker worked in the oil industry. 
They wondered whether Wu's technology could help seal costly leaks that cause drilling mud to escape. Wu helped develop a cost-effective solution to the problem, tiger bullets. It's like we painted a picture on his mind and what we wanted, and Dr. Wu just absolutely exploded with ideas and with the know-how to get it done. So from that point, you know, we changed the formulations, you know, from a panel product into a loss of circulation control product by adding different functional additives. Tiger bullets um, provide a ways to, efficient ways to use recycled uh, plastics and the wood fibers and other materials. And so you, you take everything that would have normally been thrown away and make an excellent product. We tested uh, both in the lab and in the oil field in the last few years and uh, it works great. The patented invention has already been used successfully on hundreds of oil wells in the U.S. It has also jump-started manufacturing businesses in Louisiana. Not only does um, this state benefit economically, but we have a chance to be on the cutting edge on a global stage. And uh, I think that's my desire to develop something useful for the society. You know, that's, that's my fundamental drive for the research. We have become a national leader in developing proprietary technologies that we have licensed out to major companies. Within the state of Louisiana, we are by far the most successful organization at developing and deploying our inventions. A variety of innovative research successes have also spawned new cutting-edge biomedical companies. Ag Center researcher Richard Cooper was the first in the world to effectively insert disease-resistant genes into disease-prone catfish. That technology also held potential for helping people. And I was approached by a company out of Bozeman, Montana that wanted me to apply the technology to make transgenic chickens that would express human pharmaceutical proteins in the whites of their eggs. The company, Transgenerex, relocated to the LSU Emerging Science and Technology Building, and Cooper successfully produced human proteins in chicken eggs. Since then, Cooper's team has developed a newer transgenic production system with multiple applications. The goal is to develop protein-based pharmaceuticals to replace expensive drugs. As they start to come off patent, there needs to be an inexpensive way to make these drugs uh, and we think we've got that technology. One of the ways that I describe our technology is that I've developed a, a CD player and our customer's gene is the CD. And it doesn't matter what that gene is, we can, can plug it into our system and have it expressed. Already, the protein-based system has been used to develop drugs that can treat cancer or stimulate red blood cell growth for dialysis patients. It also has the potential for use in vaccines and gene therapy. We can have a, a significant impact, play a significant part in lowering uh, the cost of drugs, making them more affordable. I think that we've just scratched the surface with what we can do with this technology. In 1999, researchers from the LSU Ag Center and the Pennington Biomedical Research Center developed an amazing technology for fighting cancer. Their new compounds worked like guided missiles. We did find that, uh, that a number of tumors, and very important tumors, uh, mammary tumors, breast cancer, ovarian cancers, prostatic cancers, all express hormone-based receptors that signal these cancer cells to do things. We were able then to use our compound, which basically targets such a receptor, which selectively kills the targeted cell. Unlike chemotherapy, these compounds seek and destroy only cancer cells without harming normal cells. This new technology was the basis for a startup biotech company which has already begun human trials with new drugs. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's just, you go, wow. Somebody had to be in the right place at the right time and, and know enough to see it and recognize it. 
It's just unbelievable. You see, there are only three kinds of people who benefit from agricultural research. People who eat food, wear clothes, or live in a house. Our research has ramifications beyond the farm gate. It's a great engine for economic development that I think is many times overlooked by, by the general public. We get back somewhere between 30 and $50 for every $1 we invest in agricultural research. The relationship between a strong, vibrant agriculture and research and development is just as critical as it is R&D we would see in the space industry. We're not just trying to grow more plants in a flower pot so we can feed more people. We're trying to find more efficient ways to do that. We need that infrastructure and agricultural research, both here on campus and at our research stations around the state, to be able to maintain that capability to support the crops that are unique to the state and very economically important to this state. There's going to be a whole lot more of us on this earth. We've got to become more efficient, and we've got to produce more on uh, the same number of acres in order to feed the people. So agricultural research is going to be one of the most critical things that's happening in the next three or four decades. People, livestock, and crops are constantly under siege from mutating diseases, insects, and weeds, and relentless forces of nature. The clash between agricultural research and advancing enemies will go on forever. That's why world-class problem solvers have quietly passed through the labs and fields of the Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station. Their amazing discoveries and inventions have improved people's lives, but the battle continues. And that efficiency is only going to be sustained by having the experiment station to be uh, the front line of watching out for us. Agriculture wouldn't exist without research. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced that as long as we're able to work, we're going to come up with answers. And they'll lead to important things from a plant point of view, an animal point of view, a person point of view.